Well, good morning. My name is Jared Edgecombe. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter number three. Philippians chapter number three. With that last little reading, Mark read the very last event of the day of Resurrection Sunday, and that was when Jesus went with the disciples to the road, on the road to Emmaus. And one of the things that Jesus said to these men is that the, the Messiah had been prophesied to die and rise again in the Old Testament. And that's a very important truth for us to understand. But some 2,000 years ago, on the Sunday after the Passover, the most uh, momentous event of human history occurred. The serpent's head was crushed. The kingdom of the serpent was defeated. The power of sin was destroyed. And death was annihilated. All this and much more was accomplished at the resurrection of Christ. And we, we like to sing songs about the resurrection, don't we? One of the, my favorite modern songs is by Jeremy Camp called Same Power. And it says, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks. The same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us. And today I, I want to talk to you, uh, preach to you about the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection is mentioned several times in the New Testament. Um, one in particular that I want to focus is in Philippians chapter number 3 where Paul e explains the confidence that he could put in his faith and the advantages that he experienced in his up Jewish upbringing and education. And what Paul's enunciation of that is, is amazing. He was, if there was anybody qualified to boast, it would be the Apostle Paul, wouldn't it? And yet, he turned his back on all of the advantages of his Jewish education, his Jewish upbringing, his pedigree for the sake of Christ. Because Paul had one driving ambition. There was one noble cause that fired his soul. He was driven and his life was animated by knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. That drove Paul. And so I want us to listen to how it comes out in Philippians 3. Will you stand with me as we read a few verses of Scripture? Philippians 3, verse number 8. Philippians 3, verse number 8. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I could preach a whole message just on that. Do you count everything else as loss compared to the precious privilege of knowing Jesus Christ. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And then here's his driving ambition. This, this animated Paul's entire ministry. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Easter Sunday. Um, Lord, you have blessed us richly in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's so much that we can say. But I just want to take a moment and just say one simple word, two words, however you want to view it. Thank you. Lord, I pray that you will lift our hearts to heaven because our minds are on Jesus Christ and on his word today. Amen. Thank you.
So Paul went on in Philippians 3 to describe his ambition to know Christ as that in, in, in terms of a runner because of what he saw in Christ. And what he meant, what I mean by that is that he, he lays out his driving ambition and then he tells his readers that the center focus was Jesus Christ. The goal that I'm attaining in terms of running is running towards Jesus Christ. My eyes are fixed on him and nothing else. Charles Spurgeon said this. Can I quote Charles Spurgeon? He's the uh, 19th century preacher from England. He said, be sure of this. The less that you value your own righteousness, the more you will seek after true holiness. The less you think of your own beauty, the more ardently you will long to become like the Lord Jesus. That's exactly what Paul is trying to say in Philippians chapter number 3 and other passages. Paul, you see, he already knew Jesus by faith, didn't he? He did. We know that story, the road to Damascus. He, he knew Jesus by faith. He also knew so much about Jesus. He knew enough about Jesus that he taught others. But what Paul longed to know was Jesus in his power. He had experienced Christ's power in his life already because he wrote these words in Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. He said, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within in me. He understood that, but having a taste of his power gave him a thirst for more experience of Paul's power. And we all understand that, don't we? We, we all have experiences that we taste and we long to taste more of. And, and the more that we experience them, we try to describe them. And it's almost like they fall on deaf ears, right? Because the only way to understand is the experience. Now, for a period of time, and most of you are going to tune out at this, I understand. This is where I am. I'm a nerd, Okay. Uh, for a period of time, I was in a location where I got to witness uh, space shuttle main engine tests. It was a quarter mile away from just one, and the space shuttle had three on the back of the orbiter. quarter mile away, and the earth just shook, and my whole body shook, and the noise, it was louder than any noise I'd ever experienced in my life. And one of the things I want to do in my life is to go down to Florida and witness uh, one of the Falcon 9 launches with SpaceX. Uh, people who have heard it say the only way they can describe it is as if the rocket is just ripping the atmosphere apart when it goes up into the sky. And it's just something that you have to experience and descriptions are not good enough. And that's the same thing is true about the power of Jesus Christ. Paul desired and longed to know more of Christ and his power. Is that your ambition today? Paul desired that his life be united in the power of Christ, and so he said these words, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Jesus first, then the power. Jesus first, then the power. Be careful when you study doctrine and precepts and narratives in the Bible, for do not study them apart from Jesus Christ. He's the heart of it all. He's the heart of every passage you study. He's the heart of every topic in systematic theology, every biblical uh, topic. He is the heart of. You want to have a better marriage? You don't need to read a marriage book necessarily. Know Christ. Because the more you're like Christ, the better marriage partner you're going to be. Doctrine without Christ will be nothing better than an empty tomb. Doctrine with Christ is His glorious high throne with the King sitting on it. Precepts and commands without Christ are impossible. But precepts from the lips of Jesus have a quickening, enlivening effect on the heart. 
Without Christ, you can do nothing. But abiding in Him, you can bear much fruit. Parents, let your teaching look towards the person of Jesus Christ. Always, always, always point your children to Jesus Christ. He's the heart of it all. And that is why Paul says that I may know Him. This makes all the difference in preaching and teaching. Pastors may preach sound doctrine by itself and it will be utterly without any kind of power. But those who preach it and connect it to the Lord Jesus Christ have an anointing which no one else can give. I know you're tired of me saying this, but I was sitting in my office just last night, just praying once again. Lord, these are words on a page. Tomorrow morning, they're going to become spoken words, and they are nothing without you and your power. It's absolutely true, isn't it? Christ himself, by the Holy Spirit, is the aroma of true ministry. Meaning that when you visit widows, when you minister to shut-ins, when you work in the kitchen in the church and in the nursery and whatever else you are doing ministry-wise, cleaning diaper, uh, um, changing diapers and all that sort of thing, all of that ministry is, is the aroma of Jesus Christ. If it's, if it's embodied, well, except for the diapers. I just realized what I was saying. Like, uh, Jared, think that through a little bit better next time, will you? Let's just move on. You know what I'm saying. So what is Paul talking about when he desires the power of the resurrection? I don't think it's so much the power displayed in the resurrection itself as it is the power that comes out of it which we call the power of the resurrection. I'm going to give you three, and that's a significant shorter sermon than what I originally... I had six, eight weeks to to work on this sermon. It was long, okay? (laughs) Cut it down to three. I want to give you three characteristics of the power of resurrection. Number one, the power of the resurrection is a proving power. What do I mean by that? The resurrection was proof that Jesus is the Messiah. Right? Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. Christos. Nobody who witnessed the Lord's resurrection could doubt that He was divine and that His mission came from God. When the Pharisees were opposing Jesus, He told them, no sign will be given you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. That's Matthew 12, 39. He went on to say in the next verse, For just as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He's given it right there. Jonah was a sign that the Messiah was going to die and be risen again. Remember when we were kids? I know you never did this. Me and my little group of friends in elementary school, somebody would say something we didn't believe in, so what would we look at them and say? Prove it, right? Yeah, just, just prove it. Well, Jesus rising from the grave proved that he was sin of God and that the power of God was in him and that he was God. Our Lord had entered into a covenant with the Father before creation. Do you realize that? Christ entered into a covenant with the Father before creation where he had, on his part, he had engaged to finish redemption and to make atonement for sin. And Romans 6, 4 says, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And his resurrection is an eternal witness of the glory of the Father. The Father is glorified through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Old, Ta- the Old Testament, as I said a couple times already, taught that uh, the Messiah must be resurrected. For example, 
If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 53, the famous uh, suffering servant passage. I want to show you a couple. There are many. I'm only going to show you a couple, and they're, they're all by inference. But it's good enough that the Jewish people understood that the Messiah was going to rise again, that there was a resurrection. Isaiah 53, after describing the sufferings, the record in verse number 8 says that he was cut off out of the land of living. And then it goes on to say, And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. And so there is the death of Jesus Christ, right? He was buried in the tomb of a rich man. But then verse number 10 promises, When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall what? Prolong his days. How can you prolong your days when you're dead? No, he's arisen. He will prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper his hand. Dead people don't prosper, right? God prospers people who are very much alive. This prophecy can only be understood in terms of a resurrection. Let's look at one more, will you? Together with me. Turn to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. This is a messianic prediction of the passion. In verses 14 and 15, we see specific details of the crucifixion. For example, he says, my bones are out of joint. Another place he says, my tongue sticks to my jaw. Then verses 16 and 18 continue the the graphic description. He says, they pierced my, my hands and my feet. And he says, they divide my garments. Did all these things happen to the crucifixion? The answer is what? Yes, it did. But then, verse number 25 begins a crescendo. Look at what it says. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship where? Before you, a living, risen Savior. They shall worship before you. Jesus predicted that his resurrection uh, would come to the Jewish leaders very early in the book of John. John chapter number 2, right after the wedding of Cana, Jesus told them, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He's talking about the temple of his body, right? So important is the resurrection to his messianic mission that Paul said this. He said, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our faith is vain, our preaching is vain, all is vain. So you see, the resurrection was was predicted. It's a proving resurrection. The resurrection of Christ is proof that he is Messiah. Maybe I should say it differently because Christ is a Greek word for Messiah. Let me say it this way. The resurrection of Jesus, of Nazareth, is proof that he was the Messiah. Predicted in the Old Testament, claimed in the Gospels, and expounded by the epistles. There's a second thing we see. Not only is it a proving power. The the power of the resurrection is a justifying power. This is good. Christ's resurrection from the dead is a release from the high court of justice that all of our liabilities that have been accumulated in our sinful flesh, they're released. What a wonderful promise, isn't it? I could stop right there, but I'm not going (laughs) to. Christ had to have paid our penalty in full. The, The Bible says this, the soul that sins shall die. There's no getting away from that destiny. Life must be taken for sin committed. There's no getting away from that destiny. Christ is our substitute and our sacrifice. 
He came into the world to vindicate the law. In other words, he lived it perfectly. He accomplished it by offering himself. He has been dead and buried, and he is now risen from the dead. Because he endured death to the full, there remains no more to be done for sin. Dear believer, consider this, and let your hearts be filled with joy. Listen, the penalty which has come upon you through the breaking of the law has been paid, and here it is, heaven is the receipt. (laughs) Isn't that wonderful? The receipt, when you pass over to the other side, the receipt that says the death has been paid in full is the fact that you are now in heaven. When the divine authority was satisfied, an angel was sent from the throne to roll the stone back. Have you ever thought of it in those terms? God looked on the third day and said, I'm satisfied, go roll the stone away. Set the Savior free. And all who are in Him, all who believe in Him, are set free by His being free from the prison house of the grave. His being freed from the prison house allows us to be free. Through the work of Jesus, God is just and the justifier of Him who believes. Jesus died for our sins but rose again from our justification, for our justification. As the rising of the sun removes the darkness, and we watched it this morning in the sunrise service. As the rising of the sun removes the darkness, so the rising of Christ has removed our sin. Isn't that a wonderful analogy? The power of the resurrection of Christ is seen in the justifying of every believer. For the justification of the representative is the virtual justification of all he represents. Let's think about that for just a minute. Okay? When our Lord rose from the grave, it was certified that the righteousness that he came to work out was finished. Okay? When Christ died on the cross, he cried, it is finished. And three days later, God endorsed that claim by raising him from the dead. As a result, we who believe get to put on the best clothes ever worn, robes of righteousness. Wear these robes and be glad and remember that in Jesus you are justified from all sin. Let me put it another way. In the sight of God, if you are in Christ, you are viewed as righteous as if you kept the law. Because your covenant head has kept it. You are as justified as if you had been obedient unto death. For he obeyed the law on your behalf. We must understand that. That when we are viewed in righteousness, it is because God sees his righteousness in us. You are this day justified by Christ, who is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who what? believes this belief is not by the way oh yeah there's this guy named jesus no it's a trust a settled trust in what christ has done on the cross because he is delivered from the tomb we are delivered from judgment and are sent forward as justified persons therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god let me put it one last way can i Jesus Christ is our head and we are the body. Agreed? The Bible teaches that over and over. So when God accepted the head, 
Jesus Christ, he accepted me. When he glorified my head, he made me a partaker of that glory through that representative. The infinite delight of God is in his only begotten. And because of that, it means that he has an infinite delight in all the members of his body. Now stop there. I want you to think about this. If you are like me, you oftentimes look in the mirror and say, you know, that guy or that woman is a wretch. Because you bear the guilt of sin that you commit on a daily, daily basis, don't you? Don't you feel it? The closer you get to Christ, the more you feel it. But listen to what I just said. I said that the infinite delight that he has in the head is also the infinite delight that he has in the body. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it? So we mourn as those who have sinned, but we rejoice in those, as those who have been justified. But one day that mourning over the sin is going to be gone, isn't it? I pray that you may feel the power of his resurrection in this respect. Be flooded with joy by the conviction that you are accepted, beloved, delighted. Are you like me? Is it hard for you to feel that way? I feel like so much of the time I'm saying, God, please forgive me. (laughs) Yeah, I had a bad act. I drove drove 5,000 miles. I had plenty of opportunities to have bad thoughts about people on the road. You know what I mean? And I felt like I was constantly saying, okay, Lord, help me with my attitude, because my attitude's not good. Right? The resurrection will make you sing for joy if you fully see the pardon and justification and acceptance that it guarantees you. I love that. That it's a justifying power. Let me give you one last one. The, res- the power of the resurrection is an understanding power. And what do I mean by this? That, that sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? An understanding power. What I mean, and this is very important, pay close attention to this. The resurrection helps us to understand the nature of our salvation. To see this, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2 to see the resurrection language in Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> There's, there are so many people who are apparently confused about who is a Christian and who is not. There was a survey that came out recently of evangelicals, and the survey said that only 4% of evangelicals have a Christian worldview. Now stop. How can you be in Christ and not have a Christian worldview? You can't. What does that survey tell you? You make your own conclusions. Some people would assume that if you go to a Christian church or something that purports to be a Christian church, that's enough. Or some people think that if you have good feelings about Jesus, if you if you've prayed a prayer to Him, if you've made a decision or filled out a card somewhere, you're automatically a Christian. Or if you've been baptized somewhere, well, you're a Christian. But the the definition of salvation here in Ephesians 2 is far more careful than just those reflections about Jesus that may have engaged a person for a moment or two and caused them to be a bit emotional and caused them to pray a prayer. Because what you have here is a spiritual transformation. And so salvation is transformation. It's a, it's a divine miracle that tr- transforms a sinner into a saint. It is what Jesus was talking about when he said, you can't enter the he- uh, kingdom of heaven unless you've been born again. He said that to Nicodemus. Paul says in, in, um, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation 
old things have passed away and new things have come. It's essential for us because this is a constant question that people ask to understand how we may know when someone is a Christian. And so here's one more way that we can study Scripture to understand what it means to be a Christian. Ephesians 2.1, Paul describes the church. Now, he's describing Christians before salvation. And what does he say? And he says, you were what? Dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. When Paul talks about the the condition of the unregenerate, he talks to them as dead in the sense that they cannot respond to God or divine truth. Dead people don't respond. Don't ever try this, but you could go to a casket and that person is dead. You could try to ask them a question. They're not going to respond. They're dead in what? trespasses and sins and then he goes on further to describe them saying this he says they walked according to the course of this world that refers to the evil system that dominates human life according to the prince of the power of air he's the one who operates that system the world system who is also the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience In other words, Satan is working in the lives of those who do not know him. It sounds harsh to say that, but that's absolutely true. And so here is the description of the unconverted person. Dead in trespasses and sins, walking according to the course of the satanic system that occupies the world under the sovereign power of Satan and who works not only over them, but in them as sons of disobedience. And then what does he say in verse number three? He says, we all once lived in that condition. And what was the condition? We lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath by the, like the rest of mankind. And so there you have that very detailed description of uh, every human being who is unconverted And then you have the salvation note in verse number four. Verse number one, you were dead. Verse number four, look at what he says. But God, even when we were dead, so what is God doing when we're dead? What happened even when we were dead in our trespasses? Verse number five, he made us alive together with Christ. And so when we were dead, God made us alive. What else did he do? He raised us up. There's that resurrection. So you've got alive. Now you have raised up. And then it says, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. So we have a picture of salvation here in terms of resurrection, don't we? Salvation is not praying a prayer. It's not signing a card. It's not a decision to reform. Salvation is not turning over a new leaf. It's not baptism. Salvation is the imparting of life to dead men walking. There's two kinds of people in this world. Those who have Christ's risen life imparted to them. If you look at Ephesians 2, you'll note how many times it says in Christ. We are in Christ. His power has been given to us. When you are in Christ, you are united with him. And his life is your life. His righteousness is your righteousness. Therefore, God's judicial judgment is that you are justified. It's a justifying resurrection power. So that's the first kind of person. Those who are alive, those who are dead in Christ. The second kind of person is spiritually dead. Because there is not spiritual life, they are dead to spiritual truth. So, 
the same spiritual truth that we sang about and got excited. Then you get excited? I don't know about you, but studying this truth excites me. The justification, the fact that God looks at us as he looks at Jesus Christ is exciting to me. But somebody who's dead in trespasses and sin, this is boring stuff. This is, eh, I can take it or leave it. Because there's no spiritual life, they are dead to spiritual truth. Because they have dead ears, they cannot hear the gospel and understand it. Because dead eyes are blind eyes, they cannot see the glories of Christ's resurrection. And because there is no life, the words of Scripture make no impact on them. If you are saved, then praise God for His resurrection. If you are not alive in Christ, if you're not saved, will you please let today be the day that you repent and by faith trust in the finished work of Christ. Lord, <clears throat> such a critical sermon, the study of the resurrection, to understand the power. Lord, I, I pray that uh, we will long to know Christ first and foremost. Love Christ. Make Christ the center of our lives. But Lord, I also pray that we will experience the power of His resurrection. Transformed, renewed, totally different. But I pray that Your power will be coursing through the lives of everyone in this church. Conforming us to the image of Your Son. Flaming the love of God in our hearts and pushing us forward in love for one another. And I have no doubts that there are people here today who are dead in their trespasses and sins. I pray that you will save them as well. Open their hearts and their minds to hear and understand their eyes to see the glories of the resurrected King, the glories of the gospel, and that they will repent and turn to Jesus Christ because the glory of God is in the salvation of sinners. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.